thank you for coming. I'm Christine Graham Mullen. I'm the chair of the Downtown Parking Working Group. Um, we, I just want to first off say we have some other members of um, the group. We have Catherine Porter, if you just see it. <laughs> and we have Sharon Povinelli. And, yeah. and then we have uh, Connie Kruger, who was a member, uh, she, but she's not, but she's still very active in helping us go through this. Um, it's been ongoing since uh, 2016, and we were working with Nelson Nygaard that time. Then there was uh, a, a break, and last fall we uh, went to bid to, find, to look for a consultant to continue with the work, and um, Nelson Nygaard was rehired. Um, they're new players, but uh, the same company. And they came up to speed. And so this part started late winter. They did some more parking counts, which was the big part of the last um, hunk of the work. And since then, they've been analyzing and looking at best practices. And they are coming to us tonight as the second forum to give us their expert advice on strategies and best practices and where they think we should go from here to improve our parking um, and um, suggest how to get an implementation plan because that's the important part. We want this to actually happen and parking to improve. So they have a lot to cover. They have um, a lot of information to give us, but we do want to have uh, public participation and your questions answered. So how we have structured it is they will do an introduction, and then it breaks into eight goals that have been established to generally improve parking. And under that, there's strategies and um, suggestions for each section. So at the end of each goal, before he, they start the next one, they'll take five minutes of questions. Um, I'm suggesting please try to keep it to questions more than like parking horror stories, because we all have them. And, also, if the questions can be sort of pointed to the goal that we're currently discussing. Um, and if you have other questions that either don't get answered or don't relate to the goals, save them till the end. There'll be some more Q&A then, and they're willing to stay and answer people's questions. And they also have a couple of other ways and activities that you'll be able to give your, your, in, your questions and input to. So. Um, the five minutes, I'm just going to have a card. So when it gets close to five minutes, I'm going to put it up. So that's telling them to keep them on schedule. And you'll all kind of understand if you don't get selected. So our two consultants, we have Matt Smith and Jason Novson. And um, without further ado, we'll give them our attention. Thank you. Great. Hi, everybody. Good to see everyone. Um, again, my name is Matt Smith, um, and this is my colleague Jason. And we're going to be going through a very detailed um, presentation. So. Um, unlike others where you kind of talk about concepts and just you know what we're going to be doing, what we just learned, this is going to be very detail specific. So bear with us. Um, that's why we've broken it um, into these various topics and they'll be taking questions as we go. Um, the idea is to really run through the specificity of what needs to be done in order to do a parking management strategy. So here we go. So. And I'm just so that um, the idea is to probably to fill that out at the end if you're doing your, your priorities, because I think the more you learn, that might change some of your opinion. So that would be the goal. Um, and then this board up here, for those who maybe if you're ranking 10, thing, it might be easier just to do pick your top three. That's why we've provided that as well. So they're, they're very, I would say, complementary. So just to kind of start talking. So right now, you know, we're going to be talking about the project process, doing a quick update, um, kind of an overview of what we kind of learned, talk about the direct recommendations and then the next steps. Um, it's really important to understand where we're at. So we've done all the data gathering input both in 2016 and then recently this year to update it. We've identified a lot of the key issues um, that we discussed at the first meeting. Then we developed some draft recommendations that we've been working through with the town and now what we have, we've created more of an implementation strategy. Um, and that's what we really want to hear your feedback on and have the questions. So the Difference in just so you're kind of understanding for those who were not at the previous meeting is that in 2016 it was a, it was really more of a data collection exercise. It focused it was very little public engagement, and so it really was just trying to like this is where you're at. 
there was not an implementation strategy, um, and therefore I think that's what maybe was a little bit confusing. Here, what we've been doing is really focusing on the implementation. We did do new counts, so we did repeat that to kind of confirm, and it was actually quite similar, which is good to know so that it was accurate. Um, and then now what we really want to do is focus on strategies in a step-by-step -step way that will help you to manage the parking. The reason we're doing this is that, first of all, there should ne nothing should be like ruled out. It, you could need new parking, you could need less. I mean, you need more, you might need less. You don't know. You want to make sure everything's on the table. So what you want to do, because of the cost implications, is make sure that you're doing everything you can first to actually solve your problems before, really, I would say, large municipal capital investments. Um, so the existing parking inventory, let's just start. So as just a quick overview, you have just under 3,300 total spaces. Over 60% of those, though, are owned by private entities, which means they're not necessarily available to the general public. Um, they may be available to customers or people visiting or employees, but they're not for anyone to use any time. Um, of the 40%, you've got, you know, you've got permit parking, which is the town center permit. You've got public metered, about just under 700. And then you've also got some unregulated where anyone can park. Some of those permits also, as we'll get into detail, also become unregulated after certain times. So there's actually more parking than some people um, realize. Just so you can see, oh, it's this button. Oh, what just happened? Huh. There we go. I was trying to do the, oh, there we go. So something, so all the purple is the private, so you can see there's a lot of it. And then the green is the, uh, is the public. So you can see how much more private there is, just so everyone gets a really good understanding. And that's a, a, maybe a, an opportunity that we're going to discuss. Um, again, what we've kind of learned is that, so again, 30% of them are open during regular hours, 40% just available to the public after 5 p.m. Those are those permits. Um, and then the rest, that 60%, isn't necessarily. There's definitely different things. There's, you have meter two hour, meter four hour. And one of the things we're going to be talking about is um, let's make that a little bit simpler and provide more flexibility. One thing we are going to keep saying is flexibility is really key. That's something that we want to emphasize as you're really trying to figure this out and implementing different measures. So um, how things have changed, really what the main things is that the regulations were all over the place back in 2016, and it has been simplified. Um, essentially, if you can look, there's you have a more time limit consolidation. There, you can, It's pretty predictable between which streets you are, where the unregulated is, makes it easier. Um, and then what they did is that the lower demand areas per in the periphery are priced lower um, than at the, in the core area and things like that. So that's a pretty best practice. But that's about the extent of which I think the, I would say the big pro um, the recommendations we normally would make would happen, and that's what we, we focused on. In terms of your parking utilization, we want to kind of understand, and this is what the first thing was, how busy is your parking? And that's the first key thing, because we can't make strategies without understanding it. So we, we looked at the different counts. And so all, what we found is interesting is your peak is actually on Saturday at 7 p.m. Um, from the different ones that we've looked at Thursday and Saturday. Many places that's not the case it would be during the day. This is reflecting something, and this is a change in how downtowns are operating. They become much more destinations for dining and things. So the peak that we always used to plan for used to be when you had a much more varied retail base, um, but now it's becoming more the evening. And this is the opportunity to start thinking about what are the hours that you're charging? Why are you charging? Those days were charged, and they stopped at different hours because that's when it was busy. This is changing in downtowns, not here, but throughout the country. So it's thing to think about. So, but the interesting thing is that it is still well utilized both weekdays and weekends. This is the key one right here. This is uh, on Saturday at 7 p.m. when you've hit 86% of your public utilization. Anything over 85% is when you start to feel it's full um, from just an um, everyday perspective. It means there's just not a lot of spaces available. There are some, but they're not as easy to find. So it's about perception. Um, in terms of the town center permits, these are the permit spaces that, are, that, pr that end at 5 p.m. and these are on the, the side streets pr primarily. As you can see during the weekday, um, there's really strong utilization. You're at about 80%. That's great. But it does really peter off as you hit the 5 p.m. hour when certain people are leaving their work probably. We find that interesting because you have an active and you have many restaurants and dining. So th those require quite a few employees. So it's a little confusing why that does actually decrease in our understanding and what we've heard is probably people are parking on the street often in front of the stores. That's something we're trying to avoid. Um, and then your weekend town center permit, there's actually quite a bit of availability. So there is that parking. Interestingly enough though, the people don't realize that after 5 p.m. you can park in those things, in those spaces, it's free. You have a lot of available parking. So that's something to consider. 
Um, and then the private spaces. This is, the, this is my favorite chart in many ways, and this is where there's opportunity, but also constraints, and we'll talk about that. Your par private parking is underutilized at all times of during the day, whether it's weekday and weekend. There are literally almost, there's nearly 900 spaces available at any given time within the study area. Um, how you can hopefully try to maximize or use that um, would be really beneficial. And then now we want to just kind of talk about what you kind of have now. So this is one of the things that we found was really interesting. There's really, that your system structure here is kind of all over the place. You want to simplify it here. I mean, like if you just look at this chart, it's kind of, you've got metered on street lot, then you've got town issued permits. There's actually a bunch of different kind of permits that even confuse us, so simplifying that. Um, then there's free parking, unregulated, 15 minute, things like that. And then don't even, then you have the parking, residential, commercial, private permit. We just have to figure that out and make it simpler. This is common. This has happened. It's because basically there's been changes made over the years. And rather than really kind of, I would say, consolidating it, it, it just, just becomes a little unruly. Very, very, very common. Um, and then one of the bigger issues is that there's really no consolidated parking entity to or person in the town to actually kind of I would say run the show. And that's, that becomes a problem when you do have an active environment. So right now, you've got your economic development coordinating it, but then, then you know, the police are doing enforcement, there's, there's the treasurer collector is involved, all these people are involved. So not necessarily the best way because no one knows who to go to. There's not one central point of contact. So when there's complaints, maybe people aren't hearing them um, or they're just maybe not getting to the right person. So having maybe rethinking this and how it's done is one of the things we really want to talk about as part of this. Um, and then your rate structure and your payment technologies, there's, you know, there's different payment types. You've got your old traditional meters, which are coin only. You've got your payment kiosks. Um, that's one thing. You've got Park Mobile, which we are huge advocates for, and we, and we saw through this process it's being used quite a bit, which is great. Um, also gives a lot of flexibility for strategies we can talk about. Um, there are, the kiosks are definitely the off-street, but then the the on-street or the, the coin ops, so that kind of limits some of the strategies, so that's gonna be dealt with. Um, and you just wanna make sure that you're thinking holistically when you get into the strategies to make sure that whatever you're doing, you're starting to bring consistency to the entire um, downtown parking structure. So, all those things are what we learned. And what we've now done is we're going to, it, we've grouped all of these recommendations into these overarching parking goals. And then the, after each goal, as was just explained, there's going to be some specific strategies. I'm not gonna go through them because we're gonna talk about them all. Um, but there's basically eight. And we're going to really go over, I guess, the individual pieces one by one. So this is how we developed it. Your key issue, your parking management structure. structure. This is, we're gonna start talking about how the actual parking system is operated from a staff perspective. It's decentralized. You've got a coordinator, but all these different um, entities actually who are responsible for different pieces. Um, so our goal would be then to create an efficient, responsive parking management structure um, that serves all the downtown stakeholders. Seems pretty simple. Okay, what does that mean? One of our priority uh, recommendations would be to create a dedicated transportation um, and parking leadership position within the town. This is a person who would be re essentially be responsible for all the policy implementation of transportation and parking. Um, it has to be coordinated. What that really does is it gives you that dedicated person who can actually then be that point person, but also the one who's tracking the implementation and also becomes that point of contact so that they know who needs to do what in order to make things happen. That's very hard to do when it's decentralized right now. You don't really know who's doing what and what it is, and even with the best of your ability. It's without having that central person who can commit full time, it's really difficult. So that's something we think would be very advantageous. Um, Here's the other piece. It's also then when this happens is to create that communication pro, um, kind of implementation communication program. It's one thing to change things, but if people don't understand what's been changed or when it was changed or what's even proposed, it's not really going to be super beneficial because it's very hard. I think people change is difficult and people will resist it. Unless there's as much information to get people to kind of understand what those changes are and why they were made, it can be very diff difficult to do. So, I mean, this gets everything from just explaining why we think, you know, right now you have the downtown parking working group. It would be great if something comes out of that to be an, an extended, I would say, committee or something. A lot of towns have tra um, traffic and parking commissions or just par downtown parking groups that really are in charge of the policy. It gives, a, it gives a little bit more, I would say, of a checks and balances to make sure that all the issues are being heard and then there's also a decision-making process about what's being prioritized rather than it being just kind of like what's the most, I would say, what's the loudest issue of the time. Um, the other piece is that when changes occur, have a very specific strategy. From my time when I was a parking um, director, 
you had to communicate it. That starts everything with a press release that goes out, just notifying so that it's covered in the local paper that can be posted online. Um, it's having ensuring that there is a point of contact, which would hopefully be that person who is now the, the basically the tra transportation and parking staff member. Um, but it's also the follow-up. Who is going to be doing the follow-up? communication. Who is going to be answering those questions? What are those, maybe I would say, what are maybe some of the impediments that, you know, get in the way of implementing something in a timely fashion? It could be funding, it could be a construction delay, things like that. Um, and then really communicate those large policy um, decisions. So it's, it's important. You need to have public workshops, you can have just trainings. It's all important that that is all happening. Um, that's how you actually get the information out. And then here's another one we think is really critical. and um, fortunately is allowed now, is that we would really suggest establishing a parking benefit district. Parking benefit districts, what they are, they are a district, you define the boundaries in the downtown of DZ, and what happens is that the revenues that are generated from the parking go back into the parking system. So essentially it goes into a special fund. Um, there's different types of funds. It can be a special fund within a general fund. It can actually be an enterprise fund. That, that's for a later decision. But essentially what it means is that that money specifically goes into the investment, reinvestment of the system. It can buy new equipment, it can do infrastructure, it can do signage. Um, there are certain parameters, but essentially it allows you to maintain it. And it dedicates that funding for when you, if you do need to add actually additional supply. It can be used for debt service, it can be used for even light, like for street lighting. Anything that, that is attributed to the parking system, that can be used. So that's something we really think is important. Um, and actually, if by establishing something like that, it allows you to really have a much clearer path to actually implementing many of the strategies we're going to be talking about. Um, funding becomes a little bit less of an issue, and it's not like a fight every year. Um, I've been through it, so I understand that's why it's a really valuable tool. Um, just as an example, when this will be in the final report, we like to do um, best I, you know, case studies, best practices. Um, in Pasadena, California, many years ago, they actually implemented one. It's probably one of the most successful parking benefit districts in the country. Um, and we, we you still use this 2011 number because we don't even need to update anymore. It's been so successful. They raised well, they was well in excess of a million dollars a year that go into the improvements of that district. And what that means, that is used for the consistency of signage to do the equipment. And so they even have, this is one of the great things, is they put this little sign on every meter. And this is what it's about. The, the money you're saying is going to improving the safety of the streets and the environment. It's actually kind of because you have a bid, it's a great partner because you have a bid that's actually really working business improvement district um, with the businesses to really, I would say, liven the downtown. But now if you have a revenue stream to actually make sure that the uh, public realm is actually up to date and the parking is good, now you've got a really good combo. And with that, I'm gonna take questions about um, anything about the idea of you know, really consolidating to having a, I would say, one parking manager or other strategies. Sure. Oh, can you? I am totally in support of that idea because over the years, I've been here 13 years as a resident, I've found that I don't know who to go to and even in snow emergencies, you know, we're told to go to our DPW, but our DPW is closed. So how can we go to our DPW? And yet if you go to the police, the police say, I'm sorry, we need, we take our orders from the DPW. So it's extremely confusing for residents in Amherst to know who do I go to? And so that idea is, I agree, it's, it would be at the top of my list. Hi, Kitty Axelson Berry from District 2. I have a question. When you talk about private parking spa spaces, are you talking about homes or what are these private parking spaces? Good question. So when we talk about that, that's when you, okay, I, this is the best way I can always describe it. When you have a private business that has its own parking, so say you have a doctor's office. This is an example that has maybe 20 spaces downtown. Um, typically, they may only be needing those during the day. Um, with, during office hours, but now there's 20 parking spaces available um, at night, and what you can do is enter into a, a, in a formal or an informal agreement that those spaces can be used by the public or even by a private entity. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. We are not talking at all about people's private driveways and things like that. These are, these are commercial uses typically. Sometimes it can also be a larger, I would say, if there's like a larger housing complex that has a lot of excess parking, that can be used as well, particularly during the day. 
So it's kind of what you're doing is you're looking for uses that have differing hours. So for instance, a business where their employees are there during the day, at night it opens up. Those can be great shared opportunities um, for a different use at night. And there can actually be, actually we'll talk about it, but revenue implications for, um, for the better for the actual owners. So. Hi, I'm Joe Trangali. I'm on the Disability Access Committee in English. And uh, one of the goals we've been trying to do as a, as a committee is to identify the uh, HP spots. And, uh, and this is related to the private parking that you're talking about. Because um, let's take, for example, the, the bank downtown by the uh, Amherst Cinema. Um, there's HP parking there, um, so if someone parks in that spot illegally, um, technically it can't. Uh, the police can't enforce the state law, or for that matter, if they're par if someone's parked illegally in any of the uh, stores, um, any of the parking lots, CVS or whatever, because uh, the idea is that because it's private property. The police don't have a right to ticket someone that's violating uh, the law. Uh, if my understanding is correct, you want to work out a you want to work out some kind of collaboration with private businesses to open up their parking lots to um, to other people. Yeah, so what you would be doing, and that's we're going to get much more into that, so I'll, I'll answer this probably a little bit quicker than I will because we'll get more. Um, what we do is you actually have formal agreements. These are contractual agreements that create like a public use of that space. Um, with that comes like the idea of who has the liability for any maybe injury that may occur in that, but also you can th at that point when it's a shared, because now it is a public use, then you, can even, you even can include the enforceability of that space because it's now a leased space for the public use. So it, therefore it is in that, that, in that realm. If it's an informal agreement, no. That's not something the police can do. Or if it's like a private agreement between two businesses, no, the police can't enforce that as well. Um, but if it is under a, pri a public lease, then yes, they can. OK, that'd be great, because we tried doing it as a committee, and we couldn't get any cooperation. Yeah, that's. Um, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about ways you can do that to actually get more cooperation. And a lot of times, it's a financial incentive, which actually is revenue. So we'll talk. So we'll go on to the next goal, too. So um, basically what we know is par public parking is overutilized. We have hit that kind of threshold, that 85%. You hit 86% at 7 p.m. on Saturdays. And we know that that ha can happen on Fridays as well. So um, what happens at that point? So really, now what you want to do is you want to make sure that the strategies you're actually implementing are really trying to get at that utilization to try to encourage both turnover but more efficient use of parking throughout the system. So this is the public parking that we're talking about. And this is when we're really talking about the on and off street metered and kiosk spaces. We're not including right now the town center permit. Um, so you want to create a downtown parking system that provides the convenient, predictable, and flexible parking. And flexible, we're going to say that again, for downtown residents, workers, and visitors. So everybody. You want to make sure a system is working for all users. So what do we mean by that? So there's, there's different steps you want to do. And one of the things you want to do is you want to we say, you want to first set the goals. What is your availability and turnover goal? That means how often do you want cars to be leaving? How often do you, are you expecting them to be opening up new spaces? Things like that. So you want to understand this utilization, and we have recommendations to track the utilization on a regular basis to make sure that your current policies are up to snuff and that they're actually addressing what they need to. But one of the things that we've noticed, you already have two, four, and eight hour spaces and longer unregulated. You want to understand, OK, what is it? You know most people, and you start doing this through turnover counts, that their average turnover is two to three hours, then that should be your baseline. That's what you're trying to really do in most places, particularly those on-street spaces. You, if it winds up being four or five in the non-core, you'll have different regulations. You have to understand what's actually happening within the patterns. Um, that's the first piece. And then what you want to do is, is it 85% everywhere? If you want it to be really easy in some areas, you might want to say 75% is your, is your turnover rate. If you want it to be packed, you could go to 95%. It's up to you, but we still see 85% as that typical baseline for those core areas. It basically means there's like one space 
right? Basically, every like seven or so spaces is available so that it, you'll find something. So that's the first thing you do. After that, you want to make sure that you establish baseline and then continue to do those routine counts. Essentially, you're doing that because if you're if you're doing it once every two or three years, you don't know how a new development or a change in businesses has affected your parking. And when you have more staff, this is more possible. Um, so you want to empower the decision makers to make that. That have that critical information and be able to make those decisions and then work with like you know a, a newer version of like the downtown parking working group have policy changes. Um, you want to make sure that you're using the data and this is great. You already have your parking on kiosks and park mobile. You have an amazing amount of data already that you can assess this and then even use like your overall revenue that's being generated from the coin operated to understand exactly where you're at. It, essentially your revenue should reflect the percentage of time being used. Um, and then you want to, but you, but you do still want to supplement. You want to know what's going on. That's why we suggest doing actual counts. Unless you're actually in the environment, I think you all know. We can sit there and talk about data, but you know what your personal experience is. There could be very good reasons why people, why it might show that there's fewer people parking. Okay, for instance, snow, if, if several spaces in the core weren't cleared very well, no one's parking there. So that would actually show a lower utilization. So that's why you have to understand that. So that's why counting utilization and understanding it over time is really important. Because what that's going to do, now we, we would suggest right now, you the idea of a graduated pricing scheme. I'm going to let Jason talk about this because he's really good at it because I always confuse people. So here, Jason. All right. Thank, thank you, Matt. And um, you know, thank you, everyone. There's a lot to go through tonight. Um, I do want to spend you know, a pretty good amount of time on this strategy because I think this is very much core to what we're trying to accomplish for you. Um, and again, we'll have a question period just after this. So you know, please hold your, your questions. But um, we do want to keep this conversational. So. Um, you know, as you're aware, there are time limits in place on most metered spaces. I believe actually all metered spaces in Amherst, most towns do it that way. You park in a space, it says you have two hours here, then you have to get out. Um, obviously, depending on what you're doing, that can be a serious issue. You know, let's say you show up, you want to come see a movie, you know it's going to take longer than two hours, and you're driving around and you're looking for a space. You finally find it, okay? And you get in there and you see, oh wait, two hours max, what do I do now? Now I either take the chance of parking here, I might get a ticket, or I'm gonna have to keep driving around, I'm gonna be late for what I came here for, something like that. That's a problem, um, especially in such a highly utilized system like you, you do have here. So um, what we're proposing here is what we call a graduated pricing scheme. So what that means is um, you know, up to, say, two hours in your core area, that's your current time limit. You just pay that normal $1 per hour rate, the same thing you're paying now, um, we'd also offer first 15 minutes free for individuals who are just, say, running in to grab a coffee somewhere. Um, they don't need to stay longer than a few minutes. That way, they're not having to pay you know, some larger amount to just run in and out. The real difference here is what happens after two hours. So right now, in your core on-street meters, you're not allowed to park more than two hours. What we're proposing is that there's no time limits at all. You can park as long as you want. But when you start to park longer than two hours, you start to pay a slightly higher rate. So that's gonna encourage people who don't need to stay too long, um, hopefully to you know, move along after two hours. But for someone who needs to stay for three or four hours, they have that option. They know they're not stuck, they're not gonna get a ticket. They do have to pay that extra dollar or whatever it may be. Again, these are not finalized rates that we're proposing. This is just an example. Um, but the idea is that you continue to you know, raise that rate for those later hours. So that gives flexibility to the user, and it means you're capturing that extra revenue, and you're still hopefully encouraging, you know, meeting those turnover goals that Matt already mentioned, um, because you do want people to continue to move along throughout the day. So, um, again, the, the systems that you already have, Parkion and your Park Mobile app, they can facilitate this. So you already have the technology in place to do this. Again, it's not always a concept that people are familiar with because, um, you know, we're used to having time limits, but we really believe that this model is something that could be very effective here and um, you know both on the user side and on the, the town manager side. Um, so um, I believe that is the last strategy is this goal. Um, there's actually a quick case study here that I'll walk us through um, specific to this pricing. So um, the city of Santa Cruz, California converted to a system just like this. You can see here um, you know, they do have there we go. So these are some of the, the examples of the rates that they have. These are different zones in town. So let's take this, this second row here. You can see for the first hour and second hour, people are paying $1.50. Then it's doubling up to $3. And then over four hours, they're charging you know, a pretty hefty $6 per hour. 
we're not recommending a specific race or that you would follow a race like that. That's just an example. Um, but you can really see what they're trying to accomplish there. So what did they find? Well, 55% of their users were staying for one to two hours, which is what you would want, what you would expect. They did have that 23% of people you know, staying up to four hours, and then a very few people staying you know, eight hours or more. So um, they also found that there are fewer citations. Citations, not really fun for everyone. It's not business friendly. It doesn't feel good for the, for the user. Um, in a model like this, it's much less likely for people to get parking tickets because they know, okay, I'll just pay that, that couple extra bucks and, and you know, get on with what I came here to do. Um, plus, their overall revenue increased. Um, especially within a parking benefit district, that means that you're capturing more revenue for those downtown improvements, you know, that really benefit everybody. So, uh, you know, here's a, you know, I put this quote in here because I think uh, this is from the parking manager in Santa Cruz. Um, you know, just really highlighting some of the, the key things that they were so pleased about, saying, you know, we used to get so many upset parkers because they were getting citations, they were trying to feed the meters. You know, then they got rid of the time limits, all of a sudden, um, they reduced the number of citations by 30%. Um, more people are using Park Mobile, and they're still getting people in and out, typically in you know one to two hours, which is good because that means spaces are opening up. So, really a great success story and something we wanted to, to share with you. Um, so with that, before we get into goal three, um, you know we can take questions on anything related to goal two. Hi, Elisa Campbell. Um, I may not be typical. I come to town to go to the movie or to come to a meeting. A meeting, I don't know how long it's going to last. The movie, I have some idea. I also don't have a smartphone, so I use coins. Do the, does this allow for that? And what, what about having some places for people who want to park downtown for a fairly long period of time, but are willing to park on the edge. Presumably, there would be different areas. Absolutely, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. So um, your existing on-street meters, they're coin operated. I don't believe that that technology would allow for this. However, your off-street lots with those kiosks, those are ready to use that. You don't need a smartphone, and I believe they'll accept you know, credit cards or coins or what have you. So, so that's certainly in place. Um, you know, another part of this, and we'll get into it a little bit later, is the possibility to move to kiosks, um, you know, everywhere, including on street. That's, that's another strategy that we'll discuss. Um, and, you know, to answer your other question, um, it, you know, there's, you know, right now in your current system, you have these two different zones. You have sort of the core zone, which is a little bit more expensive, and then you have the 50 cents per hour, which is some cases that are a little bit further away. You could certainly keep that, that model in place with this. You could have half rates, you know, in the in the outlying zone. Where if someone knows they want to park for eight hours, they'll go a little bit further away. They'll pay, you know, half as much as as what they would have in the in the middle of town. So um, you can absolutely accomplish that in that that situation. Yeah, I think that's what the main thing I would just actually say is that what's great about when you have the technology like the kiosks and things, you can very easily have different rates for different areas. Um, and rather than, you may not even have areas that where there is graduated pricing. That could be once, for instance, the, the edge areas could stay a lower rate all day long, whereas in those really core areas where you want the turnover, then that's where you can have the more graduated. There's a lot of flexibility. That's why you have to understand the utilization counts and the patterns of which people are parking, and that will help you set that strategy. Rebecca Hall. Uh, does this imply that you're going to be adding more meters to areas that currently don't have meters, like near the police station and uh, back in that area behind Amherst College where the streets are, um, I guess they're permit parking up until 5 o'clock, and then after that, they're free? Um, we, didn't, we do not specifically recommend adding meters to other areas. I don't think that should ever be off the table if, you're, if you continue to have higher and higher utilization, um, that can always be an option, but that's not called for right now. Um, I think the other, actually actually meeting that question that was, that was just presented, there are unregulated spaces that um, within the area, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, oh, no, 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 we're not, we're not proposing that at all. Um, the idea is to have those different pricing strategies because a, that's a balanced system that gives people choice, and therefore what you're essentially doing is there's the premium parking where you have businesses and you need that turnover, but if someone is spending all day, you want to make sure that's there. No, we're not specifically saying to add more meters. Yeah. 
This is good. Okay, so here we go. Oh, one more. I'm going to go back one. Hi, um, Kathy Shane. Um, if you had a kiosk that was programmable and uh, the example, if you've come downtown for a meeting and it's a public meeting, are there any ways of programming it that the rate is lower if you're serving for a community meeting? So some of the preferred areas could be, um, it's a discounted rate, it's at the kiosk. So is it flexible enough to do that if you had a code that you were given a code for your meetings? Um, we would have to look at the specific kiosks. Some of them definitely can do that. Um, that would just be one of the considerations. You can do that with your Park Mobile app, um, and that's something we're going to talk about um, in terms of a validation program. But there, there are always ways around that. Um, sometimes it's as simple as you can have um, essentially like a, um, a placard that can be used if you, if it, if, if you want to make sure everybody has access. That's important. You want to make sure it's all equitable. But most of the kiosks, you can do that. Um, it just depends on the, your ability to program on the fly and working with a vendor. Yeah. But usually the codes are the best way to go. OK, so here we're going to go. This is our third. And so while Amherst Park public parking is highly utilized, private parking at our facilities are underutilized. This is the big issue. And this is where we're getting at shared parking. So really, this is what we're talking about, maximizing those existing and underused pu public par uh, private parking, which is, as we saw, about half of it's available at all time at least almost 900 spaces or more, um, before you make those high cost capital um, improvements. And that's the idea of like, if you have to build a new parking facility, a garage, things like that, you wanna make sure that, because those are very expensive, so you wanna look at lower cost issues. So here, try to, the, the, we're gonna, this is gonna be a very step-by-step, -step, because I think this is what happens. I think people think, oh, and I think often it's like, oh, do shared parking. Oh, that's the, that's the solution. It's actually a, a process, and you actually have to be very, I would say, um, deliberate about it in order for it to work. So here we go. So the first thing you want to do is you want to identify the opportunities for shared parking. Not every lot that is owned by a private entity is going to be suitable for it. It has to be visible. You want to make sure there's enough. So first thing you want to do is you want to stack, track the status of the private parking facilities. So you want to actually inventory it, understand how, where they are and who owns them so that you have like a database. Then you want to coordinate with the lot owners. You want to like reach out to them, understand, okay, are they even interested? And then you want to actually understand like, okay, once you know they are, what are you kind of telling them? You want to make sure that are they interested in doing a town shared where like the public can use it? Or would they be more interested in maybe entering a share, a private agreement? And there are differences. A public one is where basically the town um, would manage it or they would, they would agree that the public could use it through another entity, which is like Park Mobile, for instance. Um, a private one is when like two businesses collaborate. So for instance, say there's a restaurant owner and they need parking for their employees. They have an agreement with the owner of the other building for that parking to be used solely by their employees. And they get like probably like a little piece of paper that says they're allowed to park there. So that's, that's, that's the formal but informal. Not everyone's able to do it. So this can be really difficult. So this is what we're saying. If you have a lot, a private lot with about five parking spaces, that's probably not a good option for a public shared agreement. Um, it's confusing, it's like how much signage are you gonna use? Is it really gonna add? So we kind of delineate that you should identify your public opportunities, like would be like 20 or more spaces, and then those private share agreements that you would go for that you would try to get people to coordinate their own under 20. You wanna make sure there's gonna be bang for your buck, essentially, and your time. Also, how many signs do you want? You also wanna avoid too much signage clutter and things like that, so make sure that you can actually make, I would say, a good decision about where you're actually trying to do this. Um, okay, so then, now you have a bunch of interested parties. This is what we think. You have to be ready to jump. A lot of times they say there's like a lease changing or a property just changes hands. That's when you want to get in there a lot of times to talk to the new owner or the new um, business owner. Um, have language, sample language, whether it's for the public shared agreement so that you know you're going to use it or for, like I would say, a private entity so that you can give it to them and facilitate that discussion and see if people are still interested. If without that, then you could just lose a lot of time and then therefore the opportunity is lost. Um, so you want to consider, okay, where, this is where we're saying the larger facility. You don't want to use something where there's going to be the likelihood of someone tripping. Is it in good shape? Those are who has the liability. Um, what are the current relationships? What are the uh, the financing or like the development going to be needed? All of these pieces are important. So if a new building is coming in, for instance, and they're going to provide parking, it'd be great to incentivize it. Like you maybe have a parking reduction if it's shared. That has to be formalized. You want to make sure you have this at the ready when this occurs. Um, and then what you want to do. Now you actually facilitate it. This is what we're talking about. Wait, did we just do the same slide, please? And I can't. 
no, sorry, there we go. There we go. Um, so this is the case study. There's different ways to do it, and I want to make sure. So you can do the public lease and private agreements, but then you can also just do it through Park Mobile. So Jason found this. This is a great example we worked out. Is that in Asheville, why isn't this moving? This is not me. I'm just going to go like this. There we go. Um, what happened was in Asheville, they found out that par private parking um, or private owners were actually contracting with Park Mobile to offer parking to the public that they would get in the revenue. They weren't doing it through the through the city at all. It was just happening. The, the city found out, and what then? And then, rather than saying no, stop, they actually embraced it and they started tracking it so that it became part of the overall parking. The other added benefit is that there's you kind of reduce the bureaucracy and like how like okay if it's public and you're going to share revenue for instance with the private now it's going to have to come to the town and then it's going to have to then be paid out if you if you allow the or if private entities decide to enter into this they're going to get direct payment from the mobile operator so this is a way that there's like the incentive for actually property owners to actually make some money on this this valuable land that people are not actually getting any money from right now while also providing additional parking within the downtown. So the ideal way would be then for exactly what happened in Asheville to track this. So when you know that this is happening, work with Park Mobile so that it gets a specific code. That's like the shared code, but then those spaces are being allocated through that. It's just a really great, great way to incentivize it, but also provide this again without having to invest a lot. One great thing that you could do though, the, the town could um, kind of partner with having, I would say, uniform signage so that people understand that this lot is actually for public use at a certain hour. Make sure that it's very clear the hours that it's available. Um, and that's a just, I don't know, I think it's a far more effective way to actually increase this without actually adding too much burden on anybody. Um, and this isn't working anymore, so I'm gonna go here. So questions on the shared parking ideas. Yeah, Catherine Porter. Uh, in your study, did you actually determine what private lots would potentially be uh, good sources of, for parking? Do you have a count on how many lots are 20, would hold 20 versus 30 versus four? Um, we did not do that as this part yet. Um, I think that's something that first you have to embrace the idea of do you want to do a public shared program. At that point, it's very easy to do. I mean, every within our inventory, every single parking lot is, is has been provided the number of spaces. So it's just a quick, like honestly, download the spreadsheet, see which lots have 20 or more, 20 or less, and then that's how you break it down. So yes, it's all in there. It just, we didn't want to go into making too many maps and stuff before you're even in agreement that that's something you want to do. So, uh, you know, thank you again, Matt. Um, you know, there's still quite a lot to get through. There's eight goals. Um, you know, we'll try to focus our time on, on you know, what, what are, you know, we feel are the most valuable goals. And I will say some of the most interesting stuff comes at the very end. So please do bear with us, but we want to be, you know, as, as transparent as possible. So um, this is goal four. So one thing that we noticed um, in analyzing your parking system is that employee parking information, um, especially for service employees, retail employees, individuals like that who may not have access to a dedicated parking spot for their job um, or, you know, they're coming in, um, if you're, you know, restaurant employees coming in for, for uh, the dinner shift, um, you know, where are these individuals parking? So it seems like uh, right now a lot of them may actually be feeding meters, which means that they're taking up some of these very important on-street spaces that ideally are actually being used by, by customers. Um, so that was something that we noticed, um, you know, again, in a lot of areas of town, um, you know, and previously, all, I believe all areas of town, you were ending your meter enforcement at 6 p.m. That means you show up to work at 4 p.m., pay $2 to, you know, feed that meter for a little bit, and then you're kind of in, and you're taking up that space rather than, than a customer. So um, we don't want to uh, make parking harder for employees. We just want to make sure that there's a balance um, and that everyone is using the options that are, that are most appropriate for them. So goal here is to move to what we're calling a more user-friendly, accessible, and predict predictable parking permit program. So this is all about those town center permits, um, and we'll break that down into a few different strategies um, that we feel can enhance that system and, and you know, really address this employee parking issue. So uh, the first one, strategy 4A, uh, refine the town center permit program to better meet the needs of downtown stakeholders. 
So um, the first step of, uh, you know, in this process is taking this town center permit and rather than having it be a seasonal thing, which originally I believe was devised to deal with more university related um, transportation issues, make this an all year permit. So the town center permit, for those of you who are not familiar, anyone who lives or works within the downtown district is able to pay for uh, an annual, or in this case right now, a seasonal permit um, which entitles them to park in those permit spaces. Um, you know, that only is regulated until 5 p.m., then they're open to anyone. So we're not recommending any changes to that beyond make it an all-year thing, make it consistent, make it something that that parking is always there and secure for those employees who want to use it or those residents who want to use it. We, don't, we want to take some of the variability out of it. Uh, the next step is consider, you know, expanding this area. Look at nearby employers who maybe aren't included in the area right now but who might want to be, who have employees that would want to actually utilize this. I know the Dickinson Museum was one example that came up. Um, but continue to you know, work with those stakeholders to make sure that all of the people that may want to use this permit actually do have access to it. Um, you know, Some future considerations. Right now, there's plenty of permit spaces still open. That's not a concern. If you did start to hit that 85% threshold, um, you know, right now, the permit is highly inexpensive. Um, if you started to get to a point where you're not actually able to meet the permit demand, you would want to think about increasing that cost. We're not proposing doing that now. Um, so for anyone who does use that permit, that's not something that's being discussed now. Just as a longer term consideration, we wanted to put that out there. Um, the other step would be moving to a virtual permit system. So rather than relying on these stickers that you have to come and get and put in your car every, every year, um, it would all be managed through a license plate reader. The town would just have your license plate on record and know that you're you know, legal to, to park there. Um, so that's sort of the core strategy for, for what we're thinking in terms of the town center permit. Uh, so moving on to the next one, um, we, you want to make sure that your other regulations are actually allowing this permit program to thrive. Because right now, that permit really is the very best option for those downtown employees to have a consistent and reasonable place to park. Um, so in order to make that happen, we are going to recommend that you continue to enforce meters to 8 p.m., but we want to make sure that that's happening consistently throughout town. Right now, you have some areas until 8, some until 6. I think that's confused a lot of people. People have run into issues. Make it consistent. That's that's a big lesson here. Um, you know, Obviously, there are upsides and downsides to the 8 p.m. enforcement. You will have to pay those meters the whole way out until 8 p.m. However, um, with that 8 p.m. enforcement, you're most likely going to have far fewer employees who are actually willing to pay to feed that meter every time, especially if you move to that graduated pricing that we talked about earlier, because that's going to get significantly expensive for them. And there's a massive cost savings for them to just take the permit. Uh, that's going to mean more available spaces for your customers, which is something we really want to prioritize. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, it seems like other towns in the area, maybe they're not enforcing to 8 p.m. A lot of them are going to 6 p.m. We're aware of that. Um, you know, it's certainly something we're considering. Um, but we really feel that, especially given that your overall parking peak is at 7 p.m., you know, it's going to be really tough to, to effectively manage parking if you're not actually enforcing beyond 7 p.m. So that's that's our thought process there. That, that's that's exactly right. And then you know the other piece of that is as Matt already highlighted, um, you know those permit spaces after 5 p.m. they are actually open to the public. So at that point, you know let's say the restaurant employees they've arrived before 5 p.m. so they're able to get to that first space. But then that's that's open and it's free, and it's not being used right now. So you know we we want people to use that. It all kind of plays um, into the system together. So again, a lot of these strategies kind of you know play into each other. So. Um, just moving on, you know, the last piece of this um, section four here is really sort of beef up that communication about this permit. Um, so, you know, you can see this graphic on the right here. This is something the town actually made prior to our, you know, our study starting, um, really documenting how much cheaper it is for someone to use that permit rather than paying a meter. Um, this is a great image. This is something that we want to get in the hands of employees so that they really know, hey, I can save a lot of money if I just buy this permit. You know, the spaces are just around the corner. Um, I'm going to do that. So in order to accomplish that, continue to host information sessions, work with the uh, business improvement district, work with these different stakeholders to make sure everybody knows this is out there 
and that they're uh, really, really using it. Um, so that's it for goal four. Um, you know, we have to look to take questions on the permit system. Rebecca Hall, um, our enforcement used to be six, and then it switched to eight. And I think a lot of residents didn't know that was going to happen. It just kind of happened, and we wondered, what's going on with this? And I've talked to many businesses that have said, we don't like it because we feel that there are less people actually coming into town uh, because of the parking. And you just said that, um, that the peak times show that that's not true, but I believe that's only on the weekends because during the week you showed underutilized parking between five and seven on your charts when you first, I think the first section you showed that. And then in addition to all that, I want to say that I agree that it's not really in sync when, with area other area towns. So I'm wondering why everything is based on that 8 p.m. Uh, when I'm, I, I mean, is this a done deal or I, I'm confused? So yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to you know, talk more about that. And we know that this is you know, um, you know, sort of a difficult issue and people are definitely you know, have different opinions about it. Um, this is certainly not a done deal. Again, this is just our recommendation as parking management experts that you know it's going to really open up opportunities to better manage your parking if you do go to 8, 8 p.m. And I believe um, you know the chart that you're referring to, the only un underutilized parking from 5 to 7 uh, is the town center permit spaces, actually. The metered spaces, um, and again, you know, after this, please, you know, we can talk more and we can pull up the charts again um, just to verify. But... Um, your your peak, I believe, on the weekday, there's two peaks. There's one in the middle of the day, and there's another one at, at 7 p.m. It's not quite as high as uh, the weekend peak, but there is a 7 p.m. peak both on that Thursday that we counted and and the Saturday. So, and then it's happening at, at 7 p.m. So, uh, you know, again, it, you know, not a done deal. We understand there are pluses and minuses. Um, we just feel that. You know, enforcing until 8 p.m. as long as it's consistent across town and people are aware of it, they understand it. Um, it's it's going to help you tackle that employee issue. It's going to help you tackle some of these bigger utilization issues. But we certainly understand the, the drawbacks as well. I think one other thing too is also when there's the I would say the impression that there's been less traffic in certain businesses. I think it's really important to actually start tracking how has your retail environment tr changed over time. So, for instance, back in the, t the day, I would say when there was far more, I would say, typical retail, more like clothing stores, things like that, where there was a, a, a large, larger percentage of that, that tends to bring more people as it switched to more of a service where people are going into restaurants, going into places that, that will probably reduce some of that traffic. So it's really also understanding what are the uses that are currently on the street that may be feeling like there's less traffic um, as opposed to, so it's, it's a bigger picture, but it's changing so quickly, especially the retail environment. It's a totally different world than it was even five, 10 years ago. And it's continuing to be, you know, I would say, a shift to more service-based. So th th we have to understand more than that, but that's just one piece to understand as well. I'm, I'm Carol Johnson. I'm the director of the Amherst Cinema. Um, I can assure you that my employees are not feeding the meter <laughs> because uh, they say they just can't afford to do it. And uh, what I have one point to make and then one question. The point is that Amherst competes with many places that charge nothing for parking. Restaurants that are in outlying areas that have free parking, the mall, et cetera. So um, what about that? And uh, the, the fundamental question is, do you, do you really have evidence that employees are feeding meters? Evidence, or is that, I mean, how, how have you established that? Because sure. it's not, not my experience at all. Right, that, you know, again, every, every business is, is different. Every business has different needs. Um, you know, again, we're, we're not able to stand here and say, yes, we have absolute proof that this is happening X percent of time. Uh, we're, you know, we can't, we can't say that. But we have learned from speaking with various stakeholders that they have heard from their employees that they feel like they need to do this, or that's what they are doing, or that they're not aware of the town center permit, and they're not using it, things like that. Um, I can't tell you exactly how much or how often that's happening. It's just something that, that we have to 
we're not going to stay consistent. And I think to speak to the other part of your question, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you do have to compete with areas that have free parking. That's that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, I think the difficulty here is, I mean, your park your your parking utilization issue is it's almost like it's a good issue to have. Your parking is full because people want to be here. They want to come here. They want to go to these restaurants, to these businesses. That's why that's happening. So the flip side of that is it's creating a problem because it's so popular that now people, they're, they're kind of having trouble finding you know, a parking space, right? So you, you want to strike that balance between the popularity that you have and this understanding that people really do want to come here. They're willing to pay for parking. That's why it's crowded. Um, and and you know, again, there, there's pluses and minuses. You're absolutely right. There will always be places with free parking. Um, in a downtown managed parking environment, you just can't afford to, to have free parking. Now, there are a couple supplemental strategies that we're going to get to um, that are coming up that I think can play into this. And that's parking validation and potential valet systems as well. We'll talk more about that. But I think if there's a concern about um, people not coming here because they don't want to pay for parking, Parking validation could be a you know fantastic way to to help out with that. So uh, we'll get we'll get into that more. I also want to counter the idea that parking is free anywhere. Um, so when you talk about there's free parking when you go to say the mall, that parking is being built into the lease prices of those restaurants. I'm sorry, but when you go to many of the the chain restaurants, these bigger I'm not going to name any, they're not cheap. They're often more expensive than the local restaurants, and that's because a lot of them are not like your like like. I would say, you know, if you're going to like, I'll say if you're going to like a fast service, but you are paying for that parking, believe it or not. It's just put into the price of what you're, of what you're actually paying for. That's just general math in terms of the way they actually have lease rates because they have to pay for the management and the plowing and everything of that parking. So there are different pieces. In some ways you can look at here, you're paying for that for the maintenance of it as well. The other piece is that where those free parking that we're talking about are, they tend to be strip malls and malls. People are coming to downtown because there's an environment here. If you keep paving it over and adding surface lots, now you're creating a, essentially like a suburban shopping mall. That's not why people are coming to downtown Amherst. It is also about the environment, and that cost, th there are some costs that come in, that are incurred by that. So I think that it's, it's not always as simple as everything. It's like people think the roads are free. They're not free. We pay for that in taxes. We do all these kinds of things. So there has to be ways to pay for all this various upkeep. Um, so it, it's a much bigger, I would say, macro and micro <laughs> and equation than that, but nothing really is ever free. It's just baked into the cost of things. Just want to think. Any questions? Uh, Oren Nissenson, is there any concern about your reason the hours to eight and increase in the rate is discouraging poor people and people in fixed incomes and only from coming into town? Yeah, th thank you. I, th I think we're certainly aware of that concern and we want to make sure that there is not an, you know, an equity issue in your, in your parking system. So the current parking system does have the more expensive dollar an hour spaces kind of in the core and then a little bit further out you have um, 50 cent spaces. So we would want to keep a similar model. We would want to preserve those more discount spaces, you know, that are still really not that far from the center of town, um, because we do want to have a, a more affordable option for people um, who may be at a lower income level. So we would absolutely want to keep that that space. The advantage, and we're talking about technology, that can be really great with that too, is that when you're using these payment systems, you can actually pre-program, like if, so for instance, there can be senior rates and things like that. Those are always options. Um, it depends on the level of the, I would say, of the technology in which you purchase. So those are things to consider. I know that where I had worked, there are lower rates um, that are implemented. For instance, there's a resident rate versus like a visitor rate in places like that. Um, it just depends on what differences you want to do. but the, the more technology, the better it actually can become. And, and again, just to, to quickly, um, sorry, you know, continue to answer that. Uh, you know, I, I just want to highlight the fact that under that graduated pricing scheme, we're not actually recommending increasing the rate that you have now. We're just saying allow people to park beyond the current time limit at a higher rate. But the the rate up to your current time limit of you know, which is two hours in most places, 
that should just stay the, the same. We're not recommending at this time to, to increase that. That's something in the future with that park, you know, by observing parking utilization, a decision could be made at a later time, but we're certainly not recommending that right now. I, sorry, I had a question about the permits and and employees like at restaurants. And it seems, I've never been one, but it seems to me that many people in that situation may feel their job is not permanent for a year. Can they buy a permit for six months or three months, or is that possible? That, thank you for bringing that up, because that reminds me that I forgot to mention that part. <laughs> so thank you. Um, we would absolutely recommend uh, you know, moving to most likely a quarterly system for that. It'd be in effect all year, but it would renew on a quarterly basis because you're absolutely right. Some of this, these employees are seasonal, so you wouldn't want to lock them into an annual permit when, you know, maybe they only need three or six months. Okay, so that's it. Uh, let's move on to goal five. Um, so uh, this is really all about technology here. So right now, uh, you know, you have various different parking payment technologies. You've got Park Mobile, you've got your kiosk, and then you have, of course, those coin meters on the street. So um, what we want to do for you is, you know, move to a parking technology that enhances your availability and your performance and just general convenience. We want people to pay in as many different ways as possible, as consistently as possible throughout town. Um, another thing that this can help you do is, is track your utilization data more easily and streamline your, your enforcement system. So I'll just get right into the first strategy. So uh, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with these kiosks. We would propose that um, maybe not in the immediate term, but looking a little bit further out, um, convert those on-street meters to kiosks. So uh, that gives you a lot more flexibility in how people can pay and how data can be tracked. It's consistent with what you're already doing in your off-street lots. Um, another thing it would allow you to do is potentially, um, you know, remove painted stalls if you wanted to allow people to just sort of maximize that parking efficiency because they're just you know, paying at that kiosk, not based on a specific space. Um, and that's really all there is to it for that one. I mean, we feel there are a lot, you know, there's a lot more flexibility, a lot of advantages with uh, that sort of payment technology. And of course, that works with uh, Park Mobile as well. Um, so moving on, license plate readers are something that we really advocate for as well, um, particularly on the enforcement side. This makes it very easy for enforcement um, you know, personnel to um, quickly scan through a lot or on street. Um, it can deal with both permits and park mobile and however you paid for your parking spot. It can handle all of that um, and make it a lot easier to sort of formalize some of these enforcement practices rather than sort of going about and just checking things here and there. Um, it allows you to be very consistent. Um, there is an upfront cost for that and um, you know, we're aware of that. There are you know, joint procurement uh, programs that you can actually use to, to make that a little bit more affordable for the town. Um, and then moving on here to the last piece, um, we wanna use technology to really enhance communication efforts in general, um, whether that's real-time availability or other options. Uh, particularly in some of your larger lots, um, there are technologies that can allow you to post availability in that lot online, right on this map that you already have today. You already have an interactive a web map for parking. Um, another thing we want to highlight here is you'll notice only the metered parking is visible on this map. Um, those town center permit spaces are totally not there. And that's a critical part of your parking system, both for the permit holders themselves and people who don't realize, oh, I can actually park there completely for free after 5 p.m. That actually goes back to that, that equity issue as well. You actually have after 5 p.m. this totally free parking right in the center of town that's, that's not being used. So, uh, you know, we think that that type of enhanced communication, enhanced information for people coming here um, to use really all of their parking options, that could be a really key uh, benefit for you as well. So, uh, I know we kind of breezed through that one, but we'll take questions on uh, goal five. Thanks. Um, so, in all honesty, it's not a question about point five, but just to quickly. I don't fully understand how, I mean, you know, I'm sure you explained this, but how raising the number of hours you can park somewhere will help turnover if the problem is there's not enough spaces. 
Great. Yeah, I'd be ha happy to talk about that more because because we are you know we want to make sure that we we hit home with that with that system. So, uh, what we're proposing is that you continue to to you you remove time limits, but you use pricing to encourage people to move along after a certain amount of time. So right, you know, let's say there's a current currently there's a two hour time limit. So up to two hours, you just pay your normal dollar an hour, but after that you start to pay a lot more per hour. Maybe you, you're paying $2 per hour or $3 per hour. We're not recommending specific rates at this time. Um, but the idea is that only the individuals who really, really want or need to be there for a longer amount of time are gonna be willing to pay those higher rates. And for everyone else, it's just the added convenience of knowing, oh, I came here to do something that's gonna take me two and a half hours. And then instead of being scared away from a two hour parking spot, they know that they can just pay that extra you know, extra dollar to get in for the for the time that they need. But you would the the you know to encourage that turnover, as you're mentioning, you have to make sure that the rate continues to go up the longer you stay to to encourage that movement. It's also as we were saying, there's this in, incredible amenity called the town permit spaces that are free after 5 p.m. By adding the increase of the cost of that, it actually may people who want to choose to not pay and have a free space will be more likely to go to those areas. That's why it's about communicating that those spaces are available as well, so you're giving people a choice. It's not that you don't have any parking available. Right now, your metered spaces are very full. But your unregulated spaces, there is availability. Your town center permit areas, especially after 5 p.m., there is availability. So what the whole thing is is that you're pricing to reduce people's time at those spaces to increase turnover at those key convenient spaces while providing those other options, those lower costs, and in, in this case, free options further away so that people who do not want to pay, there is parking. And the reality is, this is not a huge downtown. Even these spaces are not far. You are still within a two to three minute walk at most for most of these spaces. So it's about communicating and getting people to understand. I like to use this analogy. You go to a mall, I got parking right next to the door. The store you're going to is down the hallway about four or five minutes. You still have to walk really far. It's, it's all of this, a lot of it is psychological. So you really have to think about how you're communicating your entire parking system, what it actually means to walk a block, which is also good for you, just want to say. Um, and then to, to not say that just because you cannot find a space in front of your desired location does not mean there's no parking. That is really critical. Um, it's all about how you look at it and that the fact that there are options just um, Hi are there So I mean I believe that there's currently some of the metered spaces that are tied into park mobile Is that correct? Like I've seen the stickers on some of them. Do you know what percentage of the meters have that capability right now? I mean, I do think that's a really valuable tool and I know like throughout downtown Northampton they have that so, like, and I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe all of the spaces work with okay. Park Mobile. I mean, just because you mentioned it as like a recommendation, so I didn't know if all of them were tied in or not. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, they they currently are all tied in. I mean, I think there are some more advanced features which we're going to talk about shortly um, that you can use with Park Mobile that aren't currently being used, like that parking validation and the shared parking that Matt already mentioned. Um, it's it's a really really critical tool for the town. So. Um, you know, we do want to, to advocate for it as much as possible. I just have a, I have a quick question on the permitted spaces that are free after five. How does the kiosk know that there is not a car in that space if there's no technology at that space? Yeah, so, so again, that, while well, under your current technology, I believe those permits are all enforced by hand. Someone has to actually go out and see that you visually you know, have that sticker. In the future system that we're proposing, um, you don't need a kiosk on those streets. If you have license plate readers and you move to a what we call a virtual permit system, there's no stickers anymore. Um, the town just has a record in that system of your license plate. And when the license plate reader scans it, it says, oh, this person you know, has a town city permit, so they're, they're legally parked here. So that would be the future. No, no, the, so, so I should have expanded on it. The, the license plate readers can be either a handheld unit or uh, something mounted on a vehicle. And the, you know, it might be a police vehicle or, or some other vehicle. It can just drive down the street and it will scan all of the license plates um, along, as it goes down. 
and flag any that you know are, are parked uh, illegally. There we go. Um, we have about 15 minutes left on our schedule. I know um, Matt and Jason were willing to hang out, and I'm going to hang out afterwards too. Um, so they're still going to take a couple of questions after each one, but we're going to try and I'm going to probably cut it off sooner rather than later just so they get through the entire presentation. Um, I'm also available. My information's on the parking website, the Downtown Parking Working Group webpage. Um, feel free to email me questions and comments at any time, and I can, if I don't know the answers, I can reach out to Jason and Matt. Um, but I just, I want to be respectful of everybody's time and, and understand that this was scheduled um, till seven o'clock. So I just want to put that on. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. Yeah, that, again, there's a lot to cover. Um, I'll try to be, you know, uh, you know, relatively brief with these last few, but we do want to cover um, everything to the extent possible. So goal six, uh, this is all about making your parking customer friendly. That's a big priority here. We noticed that some of your existing enforcement policies, your existing parking policies, not exactly customer friendly. Again, as we've noted, you know, you're not enforcing to consistent hours throughout town. That's confusing for customers. We're aware of these issues. So our goal is to implement programs that make parking in Amherst more inviting and more convenient overall to customers. So I'll get into some of the, the ideas that we have regarding that. So first is this parking validation system that we've mentioned already a couple times. Um, and I think this goes hand in hand with some of the other concerns uh, about that 8 p.m. enforcement time. So um, with that Park Mobile app that you have now, that app comes with the functionality for business owners to offer a code to people that frequent their business that is going to validate their parking. Um, so if there's concern about that cost, this is a very easy way to manage that. Um, typically, this would be something that uh, you know the, the business owners opt into. They're willing to, to pay to you know, support that cost. And then it's as simple as distributing those codes. Very easy to use for anyone that has the app. Um, you, know, you have all the technology in place already. So there's really no other additional cost to this. Obviously, um, you know, the expectation is typically that the business owner is, is paying you know, to, to cover that cost. Uh, but again, it's ready to implement now. So um, we think this could be a big part of a more customer-friendly uh, system. Another part of this would be special events or something like meetings. I know that's come up a few times. Um, you could offer codes to, through this to validate for things like that as well. So really anything that uh, you would want to validate parking for, you can you know, already do it through this Park Mobile app. So um, really good strategy there. And then moving on, um, another thing that we think could uh, help to tackle this issue is a shared valet program. So this is something, you know, possibly through a business improvement district or just a group of uh, private business owners that band together, um, creating a valet program that they share, making it easier for people to park. You know, they can pull up in front of the business. Uh, they don't have to worry about parking somewhere if they're coming to Amherst for the first time. Um, you know, the town could help to coordinate that, although they wouldn't actually be running it themselves. Although, if there was enough demand for something like this, the town could, in fact, offer you know up part of the parking area that they own to actually be used for this valet system. But of course, you wouldn't want to do that unless you know that the demand is there. Uh, but it's it's certainly a possibility. Uh, and then moving on, um, you know, we want to make sure that the enforcement itself is is really customer friendly. So um, we like to call this a you know, a parking ambassador model. So rather than um, you know, having enforcement officers who are out there, their real job is just to, to issue citations. Uh, parking ambassadors are actually out there to offer information for visitors, for people who are coming from out of town. Um, they may not know where to park. Ambassadors are there to show you, hey, here's where you could legally park. Here are your different options. Here's how the payment system works. Here's a map, things like that. Um, there are other elements of this as well. Offering first-time forgiveness we think is important. Typically, if people are coming to a new place, they might make a mistake might park in the wrong spot, should they really be penalized for that? We definitely want them to come back to town to continue to frequent these businesses. So that's very important. Another thing would be formalizing um, you know, an eight minute grace period. I think the enforcement officers are already basically doing that. I don't think they're running out there to you know, ticket someone as soon as they're five seconds over, but you would want to make that a formal policy that you don't issue a citation to someone until they've parked over by you know, eight minutes. You want to be consistent about that. Uh, Again, this would involve some retraining of the enforcement staff, maybe some rebranding, but uh, you know, moving to a, to a model like this can be very, very effective. Yeah, 
it's it's it, you know it's certainly more difficult with the point meters to understand and track that time. Whereas, exactly with the kiosks, it's very easy for the reinforcement staff to do that. Um, so that's it for goal six. Um, any questions on goal six? If you don't have a park mobile app because you don't use a cell phone, will you be penalized in terms of, uh, you know, having that validation? Yeah, I think that's an important question. I think, um, you know, the reason we're highlighting the park mobile validation is because it's very easy to implement. The town and business owners can work together to do that right now. But there are other ways to do parking validation too. So. Um, again, I you know I believe most kiosks are able to do something like that as well. Um, so again, it would be a matter of the town working with their vendors to provide that technology to understand how that validation system would work, and then talking to the business owners to say, hey, you know, here's something. If you're interested, you can offer validation. Here's how you, how you do it. So it's not it, it's not uh, you know just Park Mobile, although that is perhaps the easiest. So just to clarify, when you're talking about the validation by the business owner, they are going to absorb the cost of that hour or two hours. It's not going to be something that the town will forgive because it's a local business owner? Um, that's, you know, that's the typical model. I don't think uh, we have a uh, you know, discrete recommendation on exactly how to fund that system. You know, there, are, there are a variety of ways. That may be the typical model, but of course, if you move to a parking benefit district, um, that would be a potential way to fund it. Um, or you know the business improvement district, if business owners want to band together to, to fund it that way, um, those are all options. Okay. So we're not recommending you know, oh it has to be on, on the business owners. That's just a typical model. And no. And of course, all of these, including the eight-minute grace period on the um, old-fashioned meters, if you will, those are all based on using the technology and the apps that are on everybody's smartphone, therefore sort of negating the community that doesn't have smartphones? Uh, not, not, those are not. So the, the eight-minute grace period um, and the other enforcement protocols, those don't require you to use Park Mobile. Okay. Um, that can all happen with your, your other technologies as well. I mean, we are advocating to convert your, you know, pure point operation meters to kiosks because it does give you a little bit more flexibility. Yeah. Uh, but you certainly don't have to have a, a smartphone to, to get your eight-minute grace period. Okay. And ostensibly, uh, a business could hand you a code and you would scan it at the kiosk and it would give you that um, payback or however you're describing I, it, correct? I, I believe that's correct. Okay. And the last question I had is your valet concept. Is that that's a stable one location valet? service, not valets sort of placed all over town. Yeah, uh, okay. again, that, you know, we, we're, we're proposing that as an idea yeah. and trying to give some models of how it, it could work. Um, again, it's going to come down to the n in individual needs of those businesses that mm -hmm. are participating. You know, the town could sort of uh, serve in a coordination role. And if there, you know, if there was big demand, again, they could offer up a parking area even to use, for, to use it. But, um, you know, that's kind of the level of, of that recommendation. Uh, so, uh, on to goal seven. So, uh, this is all about um, your wayfinding, your signage, your lighting, other aspects of your downtown environment that really play into where people are willing and able to park. Um, so, we feel this is very important. Um, the goal here is to improve your wayfinding and signage so it's intuitive, um, so that people are willing to park two blocks down the street and not feel like they don't know where they're going, uh, things like that. So, uh, I'll just get right into it. So. Uh, the, the key here with your signage is make sure it's highly visible and make sure it's consistent. And that doesn't just mean consistent around town, it means consistent with your online materials. It means that anything related to Amherst parking, it's got the same colors, the same fonts, the same style to it so that people immediately see that and they know where to go. Um, and it needs to work for both people in their cars who are looking to park as well as once you get out of your car, you need to figure out where you're going to. So. Um, both aspects of that are really, really important. Um, 
you know, right now we've, we've pulled some pictures here of some of your existing, you know, you may be familiar with some of these areas. Um, you can see there's some, uh, you know, different colors, different types of signs. There's this, I think this is a favorite here, this alleyway. Um, you know, it's one of the critical pathways to get back um, to your, your biggest parking area. And obviously that doesn't look very inviting. So, um, you know, it's just little things like that that are easy to pass by, um, but they actually make a big difference to the user experience. So all of these locations here are areas that we're, we're calling out as saying, these are key locations to put signage. Um, we're not here today to tell you exactly what colors, what, what does that signage look like, but these are the spots. You need to make sure that anyone, whether it's in a car or on foot, they can tell where parking is and they can tell where their you know, favorite destinations are around town. It's really, really important. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember we were walking around and we saw, we actually didn't understand what was happening when we saw that sign. Um, so again, just, just being consistent and, and as clear as possible. Um, so, I'll, you know, here are some examples of signs that we think work really, really well. Um, obviously, these are from all different cities. They're not, you know, consistent with one another. But anything you can do to show real-time availability, maybe in some of your bigger lots, or if you see up in the, um, you know, upper left there, um, there's actually, I know it's a little bit difficult to read, but it's actually showing the entire day. It's showing how this space is regulated at different hours. So say your town center permit, you could have a sign out there that shows you, okay, from eight to five, you need a permit, and then in, from five onward, it's free. Anyone can park there. Just little things like that that make it totally clear at any time of day what you're able to do and, and how it works. Um, so, you know, the other part of this uh, beyond the signage is really the lighting, the pedestrian infrastructure, and just general safety amenities. So I think, um, you know, another reason people may not be using those town center permit areas is they don't feel comfortable doing so. The lighting is not always so great on some of those side streets. Um, we want to call out those areas and say, um, you know, those streets really should be looked at for improved lighting so that people feel like, hey, this is somewhere I'm actually supposed to park, not somewhere that's like off limits at night, especially for those nighttime employees. That's, that's a big deal. Um, you know, beyond that, just ensuring that you have crosswalks in your key locations, coming, uh, you know, to and from your biggest parking lots, uh, making sure your sidewalks are well maintained. All of those things can really be contributed to also through that parking benefit district. That's another reason why we feel that could be so beneficial. You can fund those improvements directly with, with uh, parking revenues. So we're, we're almost done. We've got one more goal, but uh, we'll take questions on, on goal seven. Well, actually, I'm not sure that this is a question, but I have noticed that a lot of the permit parking spaces, you can hardly get to them. You can't even open up your driver's door because there's so many bushes on the side. Um, I assume that could be part of a program to clean up those spots? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely think that could be part of it. I mean, a lot, you know, a lot of these side streets, there are private homeowners there, so of course you need to be cognizant of some of their needs. Maybe not all the streets, certainly, but I believe on some. But regardless of what the uses are next to the street, you know, you have to be aware of their needs as well. But yeah, you want to do everything you can to make it as easy to get in and out of those, those other places. Hi, so just in terms of the kiosks for the parking, I mean, it's it would be great if they're 
to be, this is a short question too, but in terms of lighting, like some of the current ones are really um, poorly lit. And I know that's come up as an issue for many people that you can't even really see well at night. Um, also in terms of the accessibility of the kiosks, like I don't know if they're available at different uh, heights and so on for people, because it seems like most of the ones I've seen are pretty high, so. Thank you, yeah, that, that's very important. Um, I, you know, I don't know if we've explicitly heard the issue of lighting of the kiosks until right now, so thank you for, for bringing that up. Uh, that's very, very important. If you can't use the kiosk because it's too dark or it's not accessible for you, um, that's obviously a, a big issue. So um, you know, thank you for raising that, and we'll continue to, to look at that as a key issue. So I think, um, you know, with that, I'll move on to the final goal here. This is goal eight. Uh, uh, you know, we think this is an important goal as well. So again, this relates back to that key issue of your overutilized public parking. We've already talked a lot about that. Uh, but this goal is all about how can you actually add new parking? How can you add more parking, more facilities, um, and when should you do so? So we, you know, because of the expense of parking, uh, we don't want to come out and say, okay, start adding parking now. You want to track that utilization, as, as Matt already discussed. Make sure that you're surpassing 85% a lot consistently. And that's the moment when you can start to say, OK, now maybe we really need to think about how we can construct new parking. The other big part of that is working with developers and other you know, private individuals to, to help do so and, and help fund that. So um, that's going to be our focus on, on this goal. So before we get into the, the bigger facility con you know, sort of uh, ideas. We want to talk about some smaller design interventions that can be helpful. So right now, um, your stalls for your on-street spaces are 22 feet. Um, they don't need to be that long. You can easily get away with 20 feet based on modern vehicles. That's going to get you, you know, almost 10% more spaces. Obviously, there's some variations based on where curb cuts are, things like that. Um, but that's a very easy thing to do. It's going to gain you more spaces. So we would absolutely recommend doing that. Uh, again, you know, shifting to kiosks, maybe that's a little bit further away. If you wanted to, and you know this isn't going to work everywhere, but you could actually eliminate the striped stalls completely, let people park as close together as, as possible on these on-street blocks. That may gain you a few more spaces as well. Um, and then the other part of this is off-street facilities, um, or you know whether they're public or private. If there are things that you can do to coordinate between private surface parking lot owners who may be next to each other, is there an opportunity for them to work together change the configuration of those lots, add more spaces, the town could participate in that process. Um, or if there was a you know shared lease agreement, to use that as public parking, even perhaps participate in some of the funding aspects as well. So looking for those opportunities, for example, this is, is Boltwood Garage from you know an aerial view here. We noticed there's a lot of extra pavement in some of these areas. You could certainly, um, you know, we feel add additional spaces. You can see that yellow highlighted area. Uh, that's an opportunity. So it may not gain you a whole lot of spaces, but given how few options you have to actually add to your space count, little things like that, they can be really, really important. So we wanted to call that out as well. So um, you know, next is this uh, you know, sort of bigger idea here. How can we actually add new, new parking facilities? Well, a lot of this is going to come down to public-private partnerships. Because of how expensive parking is, we want to look at what developers are doing and, and work with them to, to meet both their needs and, and the town's broader needs. Developers, when they're, they're adding residential units, they're adding parking. They obviously understand that parking is necessary and more parking is necessary. So we're recommending that the town continue to track development opportunities, continue to work with those individuals to see who's interested um, in adding to the parking supply. Can it be shared parking? And what can we actually do on a policy level to promote that? So we've, we've also called out a few areas here um, that we think make the most sense if you were going to construct a new parking facility, whether it's, it's public or private. So um, the Boltwood Garage area, obviously, it's not, um, you know, given its orientation and its size, it's not a perfect area, but it is centrally located and people are familiar with it. We also have the North and South Common lots, again, centrally located. Is there perhaps an opportunity there to go underground, um, you know, and, and add parking there. So that's something that 
um, it's one of the rare places where you actually have a little bit more space. Then we have this North Pleasant Street lot, also known as the CBS lot. Um, again, that's centrally located. It's a little bit bigger, a little has a little bit more room to work with than Boltwood. Um, you know, that's something that you would want to look at as well. And then there are some smaller ones. Um, the Amity Street lot, we noticed there's some private lots next door. Is there an opportunity to consolidate those? Again, I don't want to dwell too much on, on these, but we wanted to highlight that there are some areas that may actually make sense um, you know, for additional parking facilities. Um, so with that, I'm just going to move into the last strategy here, which relates directly back to what we were just talking about. Right now, there are no parking requirements at all in the downtown district. So that can help to promote development. It's a good thing to promote that. What we're realizing is, given how highly utilized your parking system is, that may not be feasible for much longer. So there's something that we call access management requirements, um, which the town could implement to try to actually leverage those developers' dollars to either construct more parking or make other mobility improvements downtown. So you can think of this sort of as a parking requirement, but it can be satisfied through means other than actually building new parking as well. So for example, um, a developer comes in, and this requirement says, okay, you need to provide 10 spaces for this. Well, if they say, okay, we'll make uh, eight spaces, but they're gonna be shared spaces, they'll get a little bit of a bonus. It'll help them to meet that requirement, and it helps everyone else, because now there's more shared parking. Um, they could also help meet that requirement by adding or paying for bike facilities, or new bus stops, or a bike share station, or um, you know, adding zip cars or other shared cars at their new development. What we want to do here is encourage those developers uh, to actually improve mobility in general, whether it's through parking or other means. Um, you know, another option here is that they just pay directly a per space fee to that parking benefit district. So they say, okay, I really don't want to build parking, but I'm, you know, I'll pay X amount per space um, to satisfy that requirement. And again, we're not proposing what that rate would be, but this is something that's been implemented um, in other towns and has worked really well. So, um, you know, here's a table just showing some of the, um, you know, potential points requirements for different types of uses. Um, you know, we don't really need to dwell on the, the specifics of um, each use. Um, but uh, so before, I guess before we move on, um, you know, I know that this last piece can be a little bit confusing. It's a little bit of a new concept. Um, so I do want to take questions on that before we, we wrap up. Had this kind of payment um, to a facility that was already built, I wanted to differentiate between between a proposal, and could you do it also through the permitting system that the residents in that facility couldn't get a permit unless the building paid a per space fee, so that the building is paying and the person is paying a permit, providing they have a license plate, so an existing. Can you, if they built with the idea they didn't have to provide parking, can we come in after the fact and do it? Or do you need to do it before development goes in? So, so typically, um, in order to make this work, you do need to have this policy in place prior to that development review and that development you know, review process. Um, that's how you can actually work with the developer to make sure that they are contributing into the system. Uh, and to your other question, um, you know, I think the permits certainly play a role in this. We haven't drilled down to you know, specifics of what exactly this would look like in Amherst, but I think if a developer was to say, okay, I'm not gonna provide as much parking as you're asking, but I'll subsidize the permit cost for all of my tenants who want that, something like that. Um, that would make sure that they're actually providing, um, you know, they're, they're still promoting use of the parking options that are here. So, yeah. Oh. Okay. I see, I see. Absolutely. So right now we're not recommending changing the town center permit uh, payment structure. Right now it's the same payment whether you're a resident, any type of resident, or, or an employee. Um, however, there's certainly an opportunity if you were to continue to do your utilization counts, at some point in the future you're finding um, uh, you know, that one group or another is, is taking up 
you know, too many parking spaces, too much impact, you could charge a different rate for employees versus residents. I think it's a little bit tougher to say that you're going to charge more um, for residents of a new development, a larger building versus residents who were there before. I think that there's not much of a basis, and again, that could be an equity issue as well. So um, that is a question that is, it certainly comes up because these bigger buildings, there is a concern about the impact um, that they could have on, on street permit parking. But again, um, we just don't really feel there's, there's a basis to really um, charge those individuals a different rate versus someone else. Um, there's many different strategies you can do. Um, you can limit the number of permits that are issued per unit, for instance, um, so that you know you can limit it to one or two, um, and therefore you're not going to have you know if you have like large roommate situations with three or four people, which can often be um, an issue when especially in towns that have colleges and universities, um, you can limit the number. So that's it. You can have that requirement that you must have your car registered within the municipality. Um, in order to receive that permit. You can have a more robust visitor permit program where um, to reduce the additional parking that's coming to that house by issuing only a certain number of visitor permits. Um, that's what you want to do when you're tracking above, when you really start hitting that parking um, you know, utilization of over 85% where it's just difficult to find parking everywhere. Right now you don't have that. You are, you definitely have availability on those side streets. It's just that I think you have to communicate what it is. But to have those strategies lined up for when you hit them, that's how you start to address it. Um, when it comes to afterwards, you just want to do uniform um, changes to your permit program because it's going to be the similar thing. It's people who just need that on-street space. Um, so if you can have those strategies that create an equitable system excuse me, an equitable system, but then do have those you know, restrictions in place. You could also do something like the first permit is the same price now. Second permit is gonna be double. The third permit is gonna be $200. Um, many communities do that. Um, in some places, you go to the West, they're starting to charge three, $400 a month. I mean, it's not a month, three, uh, $400 a year for a resident parking permit. Um, so there's, just, there's a lot of different pricing strategies you can use for that as well. Because the idea of not providing parking is to create more walkable, you know, I would say alternatives to driving. That's part of the idea. Um, so I actually commend you for that. It's a really, really great strategy to reduce, I would say, auto reliance. Um, so you want to make sure you have those part, I would say, those additional strategies that actually can supplement that. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I, I, I hope that answers your question. I mean, I think, um, you know, again, we didn't focus on some of those strategies tonight because, again, you don't have a utilization issue with your permits. There's open spaces. So right now it's not a problem. It certainly could become a problem, you know, some years down the line. So that's when you would go, you know, per, you know, one permit per residence, or maybe to get a second permit, it's double the cost, you know, things like that. Okay. Um, so with that, um, you know, we just have, unless there's another question, um, you know, just some final wrap up here. We want to um, kind of inform you about the rest of this process. So we're going to take feedback from this meeting and incorporate it into um, the rest of our report. We're going to deliver that final report as an implementation plan to town council. And then at that point, it's up to the town of Amherst and Amherst leadership to decide which of these strategies they want to move forward with. And you know, we'll help them prioritize that. But again, none of this is a done deal. These are just our formal recommendations. And it's up to the town to, to sort of decide what they want to move forward with first um, and how they, they want to handle the details. After 7 o'clock now, so um, I'm going to wrap up. Again, we're still here. Uh, we're going to post this uh, video recording to the website. We're going to have the presentation. We're going to have uh, the draft recommendations up there. So for folks watching online, um, please email, or folks in the room who didn't get a que question answered in person, feel free to email me questions, comments, things that you heard that you liked, um, things that you heard that you didn't like, things that you think need to be addressed in the future. Um, all of those comments, my email is on the website. Uh, you can call me, 413-259-3079 if you want. Uh, happy to talk about it. And thank you all for coming. Thank you to the Downtown Parking Working Group for all the work that you've done on this. Um, thank you to the counselors for coming and being engaged. Um, Matt and Jason, thank you guys so much for all the work you've done. So thank you very much.